Okay, my talk is about the uh, physical basis for non-locality. And first of all, we should make clear that non-locality is non-local causality. The background to this diagram here is a space-time diagram showing the separation of two light particles in space going in opposite directions from each other and moving forward in time. Local causality says that the cause of these two particles is at the common source, uh, which is right there at the center. Non-local causality says that the cause is elsewhere. Picture a baseball in flight to going to the outfield. Is the trajectory of the baseball caused by the batter or by the glove that catches the fly ball? Food for thought. Here's what we'll do. I'll give you a nutshell uh, description of Bell's theorem, show you a conceptual entangled particles experiment involving two polarized photons, which is based on original experiments done to test the Bell's theorem concept by Friedman and Clauser in Berkeley and famously by Alain Espey in France. We'll discuss the quantum probabilities for the measurement outcome and then we'll discuss the local causality constraints on those outcomes. Finally, we'll talk about non-local causality and the implications for time reversal of cause and effect. Bell's theorem says that under certain conditions, um, under certain conditions, well, I'll just read it. Predictions of measurement outcomes for certain entangled states are inconsistent with local causality. Bell's theorem was published nearly 50 years ago in the journal Physics. Uh, and it was the first issue of the journal, and the journal, interestingly enough, folded after that first issue. And for the next decade, Bell's issue, Bell's theorem was rather underwhelming. The mathematical inequality was experimentally tested, and uh, it has uh, consistently been found that quantum mechanics rules and local causality often fails. Um, present demonstration of Bell's inequality due to Henry Stapp. I will follow his analysis. It was published in July of 1977. So this is all pretty old stuff. Here's the experimental setup. We have a vibrating atom in a hot vapor in the middle. It emits two photons going in opposite directions. They are both polarized in the same plane, one up and one down. The direction of polarization is a superposition of all directions until a measurement is made, and then there is just one direction of polarization. The polarizer angles, uh, the polarizer axes are at an angle of theta with each other, and we will be referring to theta during the uh, discussion of the analysis. The uh, photons incident on the polarizers are either transmitted or absorbed. If they are transmitted, a single polarization st state comes out and is detected by the detector. Well, I've got rocks in my head for sure. That's, this, that's what's going on this morning. Uh, either that or I don't understand Bell's theorem, but I believe I do understand Bell's theorem and I am not bothered by the time reversal of cause and effect, which is where Bell's theorem leads me. That first statement I got from out of the Physics Today magazine a number of years ago, 
The second statement is more famously attributed to Albert Einstein. Is the moon only there when I'm looking at it? Was his uh, rebellion against the idea that the active formation of a, of a state can be uh, affected by a passive, a passive observation of that state. These uh, symbols are the symbols that we were you, will use to demonstrate the four outcomes, four possible outcomes of photon incidents on the polarizers. The two circles represent the front and rear polarizers. The, the uh, blank or white open circle represents the transmission of a photon. The shaded circle represents the absorption of a photon. The upper left corner is a coincidence measurement in which both photons are transmitted. The lower right corner is a null measurement where both photons are absorbed. The other two are mixed measurements. These are the symbols that we will use to show the orientation of the polarizers. The uh, arrows will show schematically what the orientations are. The angle theta is shown off to the left numerically. If the uh, circles are shaded green, the results are due to quantum mechanics. If the circles, circles are shaded pink, look almost purple here, it's due to local causality. Here are the results for quantum mechanical measurement probabilities. The four large boxes are associated with the four polarizer angle settings. These are chosen to display an inconsistency between quantum mechanics and local causality. The four small boxes represent the four outcomes of a two-photon incidence measurement that we discussed before. Um, by way of an example, the upper right, the two 50 percenters are um, obtained when you have the polarizers aligned and you expect the uh, photons, which are both polarized in the same state, to either be both transmitted or both rejected, both absorbed, with equal probability. Uh, here's how we uh, demonstrate the effects of local causality. I won't go through this in great detail, but what we do is we change the polarizer angles one at a time, and as we change the polarizer angles, we look at the effects, the changes in the events from coincidence measurements to mixed measurements down to null measurements. We, follow, we do this in two ways. We follow the red arrows and the blue arrows. Now, um, when, we, when we change a polarizer angle, we assume that the very same exact set of photons is still incident on the two polarizers. So the photons, due to local causality, the photons are like real objects. When they strike the unchanged polarizer, they will transmit exactly as they did before. When they strike the polarizer that has been changed, they will be partially blocked because of the misalignment of the polarizer. If we follow the red arrows around, the logic will tell us that if we assume that quantum mechanics is obeyed and the result is compatible with quantum mechanics, that the uh, fraction of events changed from um, coincidence in the upper left to no events in the lower right, that fraction must be less than 25%. If we follow the blue arrows around, the logic tells us that that fraction F is constrained by the difference in N1 and N2, which are the two new probabilities due to local causality. Here are the results uh, for quantum mechanics on the top. 
uh, showing the bottom two polarizer settings for uh, quantum mechanics and for local causality. The local causality numbers, less than 38% and so forth, are derived algebraically from the constraints, the inequality constraint that I showed you on the last side, slide. And you can see that the, uh, the quantum mechanical numbers, such as 42.7% for the uh, coincidence measurements, do not fit within the upper boundary for the, um, uh, for the local causality constraints. So this shows you that for a particular set of polarizer settings, quantum mechanics is incompatible with local causality. So what does this mean as far as uh, causality is concerned? If the cause is not at the source, where is it? Is it with the ob observation? Is it at the detector? One hypothesis, the common explanation for this, is that the uh, two, two photo photons are, uh, form a single quantum system, a superposition of states, when a measurement is made, um, the system immediately falls into a sting single state and that appears at both detector one and detector two instantly. This doesn't explain to us very well what really happens in terms of space and time. Um, one explanation is that the source and the two detectors could be connected in some way in an interaction and that that detection could cause uh, the, that, uh, yeah, that detection could cause the photons to be transmitted in the proper form to, uh, uh, to obey quantum mechanics. This would result in a superluminal transmission of information from detector one to detector two through the source faster than the speed of light. The uh, thing at the top is a uh, palindrome which reads the same forward as it does backwards and here I'm proposing that we have another hypothesis which is, is a time reversal of cause and effect. We have detector one has a causal event which causes the appearance of a single uh, uh, polarization state, which then retrocausally will propagate back to the source and cause that same polarization state to appear at the source, which then comes forward uh, to detector two. This is time reversal of cause and effect, and physicists go wild over this. Uh, they just uh, cannot encompass that. However, I like this because uh, everything stays within the light cone, everything is contiguous, and it is relativistically invariant. And this contrasts with something that Pamela said earlier this morning, that it doesn't satisfy uh, relativity. Uh, this scheme does. Uh, the relativistic transformations uh, will retain the same uh, the same state. Finally, you have to act, ask which detector is causal and which is affected. And I, my hypothesis is that the both detectors participate in causality. And if you have an emergence of a uh, of a strong effect at either of the two detectors. Uh, this thing can emerge on the macroscopic level and uh, would cause a uh, paranormal effect to occur. So I submit that this is, uh, this is a source of paranormal effects. I also submit that uh, my time is up <laughs> and I quit. Okay, I'm open to questions. And then we can go on to our non-local lunches. If there are any questions, I hope they're the right ones. We do have a few minutes for questions, um, even though our stomachs are growling. Yeah. That must have been the reason I decided at 12 o'clock we have to go eat. Okay. 
Well, I thought that was very interesting data, and I wondered if you had considered the possibility that there would be a quantum mechanical coupling or entanglement between the consciousness of the experimenter and the detectors. Something I didn't quite get to is that uh, detector one may, may be affected by what I call conscious observational causality and which others have called mental intention so that consciousness enters in at one or the other of the detectors, one of the other sites, causes a reversal of time and effect to propagate forward to the other uh, site, say detector two. Hope that answers that question. If you read the many people that have commented on this whole argument, uh, you'll find a lot of people that say that the Bell's inequality and Aspey experiments prove that Einstein's argument in EPR that quantum mechanics is incomplete was correct. But you'll find just as many physicists say it's incorrect. Is quantum mechanics complete or not, in your opinion? Uh, no, I don't believe it is complete because um, we do not have at this point an explanation for the randomness of, causal of causality that occurs in quantum mechanics. I believe that that randomness is connected with the uh, conscious underworld, so to speak, uh, the collective unconscious, and, uh, and the consciousness that pervades our whole being. So uh, the simple answer is that it is not complete, but we need to branch off in another direction to find an alternate theory. Well, for people Googling all this, um, there's um, Feynman Wheeler to look up and Kramer Transactional. And I wonder if, if um, this you're just applying that to paranormal, or is this a separate thing? Uh, the Feynman Wheeler work, as I know it, did involve a, an advanced wave and a retarded wave uh, involving an electromagnetic interaction, the advanced wave being the time-reversed portion of cause and effect. Uh, Feynman himself was unhappy with the outcome of that, and he went on to uh, uh, to renormalization, I believe, as an alternative answer. But I believe that the Feynman work on uh, on the advance on the advance wave was valid and uh, parallels what I've described here. Does that does that help? Okay. One more. Hi, thanks for a good presentation. Um, I wonder if you're aware of the Joy Christian's paper from Oxford last year on upper bounds on quantum correlations, and if you have any thoughts on that, especially on what are the upper bounds for quantum correlations? No, I'm not familiar with that, and unless you lead me a little further, I don't think I can comment on it. If we're short on time, maybe we should discuss it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a good question. Thank you, Chuck.